Good morning. There we go. Good morning. <laughs> Glad you guys um, are, are here. Thanks for being here to worship with us. Uh, before I jump in uh, to uh, what we have today, I have one more announcement. I know you guys just heard a few, but our youth takeover um, on Sunday morning is happening on October or October, September 29th, so the last Sunday of the month. And so our youth are going to be involved in leading some of the worship. They're going to be involved in serving in the children's ministry and in and, and, and some different spaces and greeting and doing things. And, um, and I've been asked to uh, let you parents know of youth uh, if you would like them, if they want to get involved or they would highly encourage you to get involved, make sure you sign up for that, okay? So you can, uh, you should have gotten um, several emails with uh, some things you can sign up for. So you can do it that way if you just check your email. Or if uh, you're like, well, Jay, I didn't get the email. I didn't see it. Um, just go find Jacob uh, over in the youth building after service, and he will get you guys connected. It's going to be a great Sunday. Um, we just want to make sure we get all the slots filled and that, um, that there's uh, people back there when the children are doing children's ministry. So that would be great. Um, anyway, so make sure you do that. So uh, if you have uh, your Bibles... Uh, go ahead and turn to uh, Hebrews uh, chapter 5. We are moving forward as, as, we, as, as we walk through uh, the book of Hebrews. If you don't have a Bible, there should be a hardback black one somewhere near you. And in those Bibles, we're going to be on page 1063. Um, and uh, I want to thank Jacob uh, last week uh, for, uh, for a sermon talking about contemplating, um, the, the, uh, contemplating Christ and his, his, his role as, as apostle and high priest and allowing that to, to, to bear weight on us as followers of Christ. And we see that throughout Hebrews as Christ, uh, as Christ is talked about as the apostle, he's talked about as, uh, as our high priest. And, and, and we're going to kind of get into sort of a, uh, a, a, something that kind of connects to that. But when we begin to contemplate that, when we begin to think on those things, the weight that it should carry and the way that that affects the way that we worship, the way that we live our lives. It has very real world implications when we begin to think about some of these lofty ideals. And so I want to thank him for that because he did a great job. I wasn't here, but I was watching online. Um, and so uh, it, it, it was great. And so this, this morning, um, uh, I don't have you guys, uh, do you have any beach people? Any beach people? Okay. What about get in the water people at the beach? Okay. Where, where are my pool people at the beach? Yeah, there's always some, they're like, I go to the beach, but I go to the pool. Okay, I get you. That's cool. Um, I, I, I'm a get in the water person. And when I was growing up, uh, my dad and I, we used to go out and, and uh, we would go out at night and we would walk along the beach with flashlights, you know, like, like try to catch crabs. We never did anything with them. You just would like, you know, chase them through the water and grab one and look at it for a minute and then let it go. And so we used to walk through the, you know, we'd walk up and down the shore and we were doing that one, uh, one night and uh, I had decided, I had sort of, there was a, a trough of water between, like I, I was in the water, okay? And there was a, a trough of water, I don't know, it was about, it's about that deep, it wasn't very deep. And so I was sort of walking on a little sandbar type of a thing, trying to grab them out of, you know, it was like ankle deep. I was trying to grab them there. My dad was, you know, 10 feet from me, just right here, walking along the other side with his net, and he was trying to catch them there. And so we're walking down, uh, sort of walking through the water, doing our thing. And um, the thing... Uh, well, I'll just tell you what happened. I was walking and I looked to my right. I grabbed a crab and was looking. I was like, hey, dad, look at this one. And, and my, my light kind of passed through that little two foot, two and a half foot section of water between me and my dad. And there was something in the water. And I froze. And right between me and like I said, my dad was like 10 feet over there. There was about a seven foot sand shark that was swimming in the shallow water. I froze, I panicked, okay, in the moment, and I was like, what do I do, what do I do? He didn't care anything about me. But here's the thing. I don't know if you've ever seen a shark up close in the water. It's scary. I don't care who you are. I don't care what your thoughts are. They, they terrify me. And most of us in the ocean, if we're walking, let's be honest, you step on something, you're like, oh, this is great. You step on something, you go, ah, you do the run thing. You know what I'm talking about? So there was, in that moment, there was a fear. And I tell you, you may not know this about your pastor. I didn't know this about myself until that moment. I can just jump from ankle deep water, 10 feet over a, th over a shark and hit dry ground on the other side. So, but from that point forward, if, uh, every time I went into the ocean, there was a, what I like to refer to as we're going to talk about this morning, there was a good fear. Okay. I was in the water, I was swimming, but I was very cognizant from that point going forward that there are seven foot sharks swimming in the water with me and I need to be careful. I should be aware. It's a healthy fear. Okay. And that's, that's what we're going to talk about, that, that, that we have in Christ, we, we have a gift in our salvation, but we're called as believers to grow. 
We're called to move forward in, in our faith. It's kind of like if you're at a race, like you, you, you get on the starting line of a race, uh, the idea is once the gun goes off is you run. You don't just stand there. So there's a call to grow. There's a call to move forward. And if we choose not to move forward, there there, there is that we're going to read about this morning that the author tells the Hebrews, there's a warning. There's a warning for us that should, and I believe it's, uh, well, we'll get to that, but that, that should create a good fear in us. Okay, so we're going to jump into the passage. We're going to start in Hebrews chapter five. We're going to start in verse 11. So you guys read this with me. We have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain since you have become too lazy to understand. So if you read the first part of Hebrews 5, it is more, uh, it is, the author is writing to the Hebrew, or writing uh, in Hebrews, he's writing to them about uh, more about Christ as our high priest. He's unpacking that, and he drops a big word uh, that, that Christ is uh, the high, a high priest of the order of Melchizedek, which we're going to talk about that in Bible study. But the, the, there's some, some lofty kind of ideas, and he says, so he says all of that, and then he goes on and he says, we have a great deal to say about this, and it's difficult to explain because it is. There's some deep ideas here. But since you have become too lazy to understand, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk is inexperienced with the message about righteousness because he is an infant. But solid food is for the mature, for those whose senses have been trained to distinguish between good and evil. So I'm going to pray, and then we're going to uh, ask God to sort of speak to us because what we're going to get into today is kind of heavy. And, uh, but we can get through it. The Holy Spirit will speak, and he can do his thing. He's given us the tools to do this. So we're going to jump into this. But let me, let me, let me pray and ask God to, uh, to speak to us this morning. Father God, we come before you. I ask you, Lord, in this time, Father, would you give me the words to say? Father, would you open our, our, our minds? Would you open our hearts and our ears uh, to the realities of your word, God? And I ask you if, uh, if you would move in this place, Father. God, we love you. We pray these things in your son's name. Amen. So, The author right off the bat says, listen, I'd like to tell you more about Christ as our high priest. I'd like to unpack some ideas for you. There's some some big concepts, some big things, some amazing things that will do nothing but increase your awe, increase your worship, increase your wonder for who Christ is and what it means to be one of his children. But I can't do that because it's difficult. And you guys have reached a spot where you're just too lazy to do the work of understanding. You guys don't get it. That's That's a harsh word, okay? And so the, so. He makes reference, like I said, to, to Jesus being of the order of Melchizedek, and, and, and that's, it's this whole, it, it's a whole, it, it, it's a big thing, and we're going to talk about that, we're actually going to talk about that in Bible study in, in, in a couple of weeks, but what, what, he's, what he wants to communicate to them is, listen, I've got some stuff that I want you to learn, some things that are going to add depth, that are going to add appreciation, that are going to draw you closer into your relationship with God, things that are amazing that you need to understand, but, but some things, and, and they're difficult to understand, some things in our faith Guys, as followers of Christ, some things are difficult, and they take some effort to understand. Our faith, guys, it takes work. We have to lean into it. We have to exercise it a little bit. And some of them, the reality that that the author is writing to is that some of these believers, some of them, they aren't willing to do the work required. They're, They're not giving serious thought to the things of God. They're not willing to unpack these, these spiritual concepts. And I think like uh, Philippians 2.12, right at the end of that, uh, the call, he says, therefore, uh, my dear friends, just as you have always obeyed, so now not only in my presence, but even more in my absence, work out your own salvation with fear and trembling. There's a call, if you're a follower of Christ, to work it out, to work out your salvation, which means we have to lean in. We, 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 have, we have to do some work here. And I think what happens to us and what, 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 he's, what he's communicating to, the, he, to uh, the recipients of this letter is he's like, you guys have just gotten lazy. I can't tell you more because you're not willing to do the work. And I think sometimes the same thing happens to us. And I think the way that it does, it's not that we would say that we're lazy necessarily, but that we use excuses. Things like, I'm not qualified to understand this. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to wait for somebody to just tell me. I'm going to wait for somebody to just, I'm just going to wait for, uh, for the pastor to preach it from the stage. Or, but, you know, I, you read something in scripture or you have a conversation with somebody and you're like, man, that's super deep. This, this, is, this, is, this, is, this is just way over my head. And the call isn't that we all need to be theologians, right? But the call is that we should do some work in our faith or we should lean in 
to some of these ideas when we, when we discover something about Christ or we read something in Scripture. The idea isn't that we just say, well, I can't understand that, so I'm just going to wait and let somebody else do it. That's the same thing, guys. Um, does anybody, into, uh, anybody like buffets? All right, I'm a huge fan of the Chinese buffet, okay? Just, I'm just saying, putting that out there. My wife thinks it's disgusting. I don't care. I love it. But what he's communicating to them is like, listen, what you're doing is you're standing in line at the buffet and you're waiting for somebody to put food on your plate. You need to feed yourself. We have to feed ourselves. And he goes on in, in verse 12, he says, although by this time you ought to be teachers, you need someone to teach you the basic principles of God's revelation again. Notice he says again, not, not, he's already done it. You've already been taught this stuff. He's like, someone needs to teach this to you again. You need milk, not solid food. Now, everyone who lives on milk's inexperienced with the message of righteousness because he's an infant. He says, guys, you should know better by now. I'm writing you this letter. You should have grown past this. You should know better. There's supposed to be a progression to our spiritual growth in the life of a believer. We're supposed to grow. We're designed to grow. We're, we're designed to grow from, from, from spiritual infants when we first come to Christ to mature believers. And it's natural that when you come to Christ, when we first give our lives to Christ, it's natural that we start with milk, right? We start, and he's going to talk about the basic concepts here in a second, but we start with milk until we're, able, until we're capable. Like you grow to a, a space where you're able to eat solid food. And that's the idea. But the expectation is that we will grow out of drinking milk. Listen, if you guys, you, you see an infant, and they're may, maybe drinking a bottle or whatever, and you look at them and go, oh, it's so cute, and it's precious. Look at the baby eating, you know, with the milk, right? Or the formula, whatever you use. But if you, if you were to look down here one Sunday morning, and Ken Hudson was sitting in the front, front row <laughs> drinking from a bottle, every one of you would look and be like, something's wrong. Something's not right. He shouldn't be drinking from a bottle. He's a grown man. That's the idea. If we don't grow out of the bottle, guys, then it's apparent there's something wrong. That's what the author's saying here. We should grow. But solid food, he says in verse 14, but solid food is for the mature, for those who have their, uh, who have their powers of discernment trained by constant practice to distinguish good from evil. They can distinguish. She's saying a mature believer can distinguish and can discern the voice of God, can discern the Holy Spirit. And you know why? You know how they do it? Because they put the work in to develop it as believers. They've been trained by constant practice. It means that we practice. We work at it. Spiritual maturity is developed by constant practice. You ever think about that? Do you ever think through the idea of practicing your faith? Like, I mean, when you practice, you mess up, right? You make mistakes. You slip and fall. You say the wrong thing. We're called to practice, to practice things like prayer, making requests, asking God to do things, asking him to move. And then we practice listening. Sometimes we hear right, sometimes we don't when we start out. Hopefully, the more we do it, the more we practice, the better we get. That's the idea. Reading, studying God's word is another way that we can, we can practice. And it's not just, not, when, when I say reading, it, it's not just you, you, know, you read your Bible verse for the day and you walk on. We study it. We lean into it. We take things a step deeper. You read something and you're like, wait a minute, and you ask a question about it. And you may not have the answer. You guys ever write things down? In our Bible study, we give them we have, the, we, we have the, the book of Hebrews and there's a bunch of lines. It's all the text on one side and then the next, the, uh, the opposing page is just a bunch of lines. And one of the things that we encourage them to do is, and I'm, is just, just write. If you have a question, write it down. You don't have to know the answer. You might come in here and ask the question and the person teaching the Bible study might look at you and go, I don't know. But you know what? We'll figure it out. We'll lean in. We'll talk to somebody else. And that's one of the other things. We can practice our faith by talking with one another, by seeking wise counsel on spiritual things. And I've had some of you come up to me after service on a Sunday morning and say, hey, when you said this, I was thinking about this. And so what do you, what do you think about that? And I look at them and go, I don't know. But you know what? I'll go pray about it. I'll dive in and I'll see if I can find an answer for you. Okay? That's the idea. We practice it, guys. We're not going to get it right the first time or the second or the third or the fourth. But we will eventually. And that's the idea. We practice it. We work at it. We should grow in our faith and understanding of the gospel. And understanding is important. We, we should be able to communicate 
our understanding to those around us, our understanding of the gospel. You realize that as believers, we should be able to communicate that. And like I said, I'm not talking about that we need to be theologians, but what good is it to say that you believe something as important as salvation, as important as being a child of God, and then not be able to articulate what it is that you believe? Again, you don't have to have the answer for everything, but you should be, if if we believe this, he's saying you should do the work, you should be able to articulate it, because our call is to do what? To go out there and do what? Make disciples. We have to be able to articulate what it is that we believe. So, and that requires study. But the truth is, I think for a lot of us, even, even in my own life, it's easier, it's easier for us to check out on our spiritual growth. I mean, it's easier uh, to, to, just, to just say, you know what, I, I'm a believer, I'm good. I don't need to dive in, I don't need to know all, the, all this stuff. But spiritual laziness, guys, it's dangerous. It's dangerous because it sets us up when we do that, when, 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 we, when we live in a place of spiritual laziness, when we refuse to, 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 to pursue things of God, when we, when we refuse to, to pursue our growth as believers, we set ourselves up for trouble. And the author's saying, listen, guys, you should have been eating steak by now, but you're still on the bottle. Guys, we shouldn't be satisfied with milk. I mean, milk is great when you're a kid, but what, now that you're grown up, if I put a cup of milk and a T-bone steak, and say, pick one? How many of you in the room and go, ooh, I like milk? I'm, no, we're going for the steak, right? That's the idea. He's like, guys, you gotta move on. You gotta grow up. Look at verse, uh, chapter six, verse one. He says, in light of all of that, verse one says, therefore, and when, when, when we see therefore, in Bible study, we talked about this, anytime you see therefore, you look before, right? So in light of all of the things that we just talked about, this call to grow, this call to move on to solid food, to stop drinking spiritual, to, to be on the spiritual bottle as it were. In light of that, let us leave the elementary teaching about Christ and go on to maturity, not laying again a foundation of repentance from dead works, faith in God, teaching about ritual washings, laying on of hands, the resurrection of the dead and eternal judgment. And we will do this if God permits. He says, let us leave and it's better said, better translated here out of, out of the original language. The better idea here is move forward. Let us move forward. The call on the life of every believer is to move forward. To move forward from the elementary teachings. And I, he lays this out and I read it and I was like, man, I don't know if I've moved forward from this. Because he says, what are the elementary teachings? Well, repentance from dead works. You know what that is? That's the constant cycle of coming in on Sunday morning and saying, God, I'm sorry, please forgive me, I repent, and walking out on Monday morning and doing the same thing again. He's saying that constant cycle of, God, I'm sorry, I'm not gonna do it again, and then falling again. I'm not gonna do it again, and falling again. Yes, we sin, we make mistakes. Hear me say that. But his point is, the, the idea of repentance is we do what? We confess it, and then we turn away from it. We don't keep going back. He's like, guys, we, we need to do this. Like, and, and he's saying we never take steps to actually move forward in our faith. And one of the best ways to do that is by asking for accountability. If you're struggling with something, if there's a sin that, that's eaten your lunch, you confess it before God. You say, listen, I want to repent. Then you go to somebody and say, could you help me with this? Most of us are real good at coming in and saying, God, I'm sorry, I'm not going to do it again. And then the Holy Spirit says, maybe you should talk to somebody and get somebody to help me. You're like, no, I'm good. I got it. I'm, I'm doing it on my own. But that's the idea here, that, that cycle of repentance from dead works. Uh, faith in God, reaching a point where you trust God. Plain and simple. That's the idea. Reach a point where you trust him. When things are going good, you trust God, but as soon as you hit a bump in the road, as soon as something happens, your entire faith framework is rocked. He's like, we gotta move beyond that, guys. We've gotta make the choice to trust. We've gotta make the choice to say that God has got us. He is gonna hold on to us. We are good, and I'm gonna move forward because I can trust God. That's making that choice to trust, period. God, I don't understand it. I don't know what's happening, but I'm gonna trust you. That's what he's saying. The washing and laying on of hands. He's talking about the doctrine of baptisms. He's talking about praying for one another. Guys, these are basic principles in the mind of the author. He's like, He's like, guys, this is, this is kindergarten. This is ground level stuff for the believer. There's more to it. The resurrection of the dead and the eternal judgment. This sounds fancy, but this is the same thing churches still argue over today. This is eschatology, right? He's talking end times, the return of Christ, uh, 
And, 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 and are, is, it, is it pre-trib? Are we going to go before? Is it post-trib? Is it mid-trib? When is the rapture going to happen? When are all the, like, these are, th- this is the stuff he's like, guys, listen, how about instead of worrying about when Christ is going to return, we start living like he's returning today? That's the idea. He's like, th- these are basic ideas for a Christian. He's like, we need to move on from those things. And then he lays out something to me that, that is, is, I don't know if scary is the word for it, but he says, we will be able to do these things if God permits. He's like, we gotta move on from these things if God allows it, because he's the one that does this. He's the one that's gonna do the growth, and we're gonna see this again here in a second. God's the one that, that, that blesses our actions, that blesses our things. We do our part, but it's ultimately God who causes the growth. Um, I think it's kind of like this. Uh, my son, Ryan and I have gotten into mountain biking and um, <laughs> when we first went, we went to, we go to East Fork, the mountain bike trails. If you guys have ever been there, maybe you've walked them or seen people riding them. So we, we got our bikes and we got our helmets and we went and we hopped on the trail and we started riding. We did the easy one first. I was surprised at how not easy it was, um, but it was labeled easy. So we get through it and I was like, okay, all right, we're doing okay. And then we went to the blue, okay, which is the middle, mid range. And we did that one. It was a little tough, but we got through it. Nobody fall. I didn't break anything. You know, everything was good. So we pull back up, we, we, we pull back around and we, you know, we've done it several times. And, uh, and, and we pull into the parking lot and I'm like, man, we're doing pretty good. We're pretty good at this mountain bike thing. We're getting this thing figured out. And then I looked across the parking lot and there was a group of about five folks and they all had on the same like matching sort of like outfit you know, like, like cycling outfit. And all of them are on their mountain bikes. And guys, they're on their mountain bikes and they're not moving. They're just balanced there on their mountain bike. No kickstand, no nothing. And they're like hopping up on their rear tire and going to the front and bopping around and jumping and doing all that stuff. And in that moment, I realized I am terrible at mountain biking. <laughs> I know nothing about mountain biking. These guys are the ones that have it. But what we did when we saw them, what I saw, what I noticed was I saw what was possible. And it inspired me. It inspired Rye. Rye was like, I want to be able to do that. And I was like, well, I guess we got to practice. That's the idea here, guys, is that we move on and we, can, we begin to see what's possible in, in, in our lives. As we, we look at other believers who tend to grow in our faith. The idea isn't that you look at somebody else and you go, well, I can't do what they're doing. You look and you think, you know what? God's called me to something. There's something more. I can do that. It should inspire us to do it because there's so much more that is available to us. The basics of our faith, they are essential for every believer. And hear me say, we never move away from repentance. We live a life at the foot of the cross and say, God, I'm a sinner. I've made mistakes. I need forgiveness for this thing. That We, we don't move away from it but we don't, we don't relegate ourselves to just accepting the fact that, man, I'm, I'm just going to do it again. I'm going to make a mistake. We lean and we say, you know what, God, forgive me for this. I'm going to do everything I can do to walk a different way. And your grace is going to make that possible. Guys, they're so, the basics of our faith, they are essential, but there's so much more for us. Those of you that love Shrek, our faith is like an onion. It's got layers. Right? Every time you peel back a layer, there's something more. God, we worship the God of the entire universe. He is unending in power. He is unending in love. And he's pursuing us. He has so much to give us. There's always more to learn. There's always more to love. And there's always more to worship. And we're called to go after that. Let's go. Let's grow. We're in the race. So the idea is that we need to start running. Because if we don't, look at verse four. For it is impossible to renew to repentance those who were once enlightened, who tasted the heavenly gift, who shared in the Holy Spirit, who tasted God's good word and the powers of the coming age, and who have fallen away. This is because to their own harm, they are re-crucifying the Son of God and holding him up with contempt. So in here, the description the author leaves of those who have, who have fallen away, I want to talk about this before we jump into this. The description he uses is enlightened, and that is that to have learned, to have a learned knowledge of the gospel of Christ. There, there's an understanding there, to have tasted the heavenly gift, to have shared in the Holy Spirit, 
In the original language, that idea of sharing is to partake of. In the Greek, it's a word for full participation. To have tasted God's good word. Again, in the Greek, that's to fully ingest, to appreciate God's word. And the powers of the coming age, that's to be party to the, to the works of the Holy Spirit, of God's, of God's in, like the end time works through through uh, the power of Christ's resurrection. Miracles are a part of that. The, his whole point is, you've seen it. You've been there. You're in the midst of it. And fallen away. And that word fallen away, the churchy word for that is apostasy. You can use that at lunch. I don't know if I would, would but that's a, that's a word you can use. And the idea here is this, this, isn't, he's not, this isn't a reference to falling into sin, okay? I wanna, you hear me say that, like this whole idea of apostasy, this falling away. It's not a reference of I'm struggling with sin, I'm in the midst of something. That's not the idea because there's a difference between, between falling and falling away. We all, we all fall, we make mistakes, we, 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 get, we get caught up in sin, we get wrapped up. Those things happen. This idea is, is it's not falling away and it's not even a reference to the denial of Christ, Okay, let me say that because here's the thing. If it was, Peter was in trouble because Peter denied Christ three times. So it's not even that. So, so what is it? Well, <laughs> uh, according to a lot of scholars and a lot of things, this, uh, this notion of falling away is to turn completely from the gospel of Jesus Christ, to turn away. It's not an accident, okay? It's not something that you stub your toe, slip and fall, and you turn away from Christ. That is not the idea. We're not talking, this is, we're not talking about the idea of losing your salvation here, okay? Can I say that? We're not talking about losing your salvation. Because you lose something, the idea is you're like, oh, where did it go? I, I don't know what happened. That, that, that's not the idea. One of the, one of the uh, theologians I read says it this way when it's talking about falling away. It says, this is not a matter of faults and errors, um, in other words, but of apostasy, of making a deliberate choice to not participate in the gift once given. So, can I say that I've struggled with this for a month, with this passage? Um, because as I read this, one of two things has to be true. Number one, the author is speaking to believers and warning them that their laziness could lead them to a place where they could walk away from their faith. To reach a point in your life where you have drifted so far away due to your own laziness, because that's what he's talking about in this passage, right? Uh, due to your own laziness with, with regards to the gospel that you have no desire for the work of the Holy Spirit in your life. And for, and, and for those that do this, what he's saying is there's no opportunity for repentance. Because there wouldn't, but there wouldn't be a desire for one either. Because in order, in order for repentance to be given, Christ would have to die a second time, right? Because he's already died once, so he can't die a second time. Because his, uh, we know that Romans six says that that he died once and for all. So, if you have a, if you've rejected the first one after having experienced it, then there's no means for repentance because Christ only died once. He died once for all. So there's nothing in you that wants Jesus. In fact, you turn away and you actively reject. This is not an accidental thing. You actively reject the gospel of Christ. And it's a result of laziness. It's a result of drifting. And um, in Hebrews chapter two, we talked about this idea. They talked about this idea of drifting away. And it's like you tie your boat up at the dock, but you don't tie it very well. And you walk away and it comes loose and it drifts away. And you don't even realize it's gone. But when you come back for it and it's, and it's not there, that's what he's talking about. This idea that we drift and we drift and we drift and we drift and we get so far away to a point where we turn around and we say, you know what, I'm not interested. I don't, you know what, I don't need that. That's one option. The second option is the author is speaking to those who have a form of godliness, but the spirit of God isn't in them. And that's out of 2 Timothy chapter three. It, it says that, that it's, did you know that it's possible for you to attend church, maybe your entire life, to be here every Sunday, to come to every Bible study, to be in a small group, to do all of those things, to be in the presence of the Holy Spirit as he moves among his people, to see the power of God displayed, man, to even have a head knowledge of the things of God and not be a believer, to miss God, to miss Christ. And we know that's gonna happen because Jesus says, 
uh, it says that, uh, that, that many will come and say, Lord, Lord, didn't we cast out demons in your name? Didn't we prophesy in your name? And Jesus is going to look at him and say, listen, depart from me. I never knew you. But here's the thing. Scholars have argued, argued, and argued over whether this passage is talking to believers who have fallen away and lost their salvation or talk to people who weren't really believers but thought they were kind of a thing and, uh, and, and they've fallen away. Let me tell you, regardless of, what, of, of where you land on that, we can talk about that. I'm happy to talk about that with any. Regardless of where you land, what you believe about this passage, the author's main point is this. Don't be that person. That's the idea. Don't be that person. If you've heard the message, if you've shared in the Holy Spirit, if you've tasted God's good word and you choose to not pursue it, you position yourself to drift away and there's danger in that. It's a warning. Good fear is the idea. It's kind of like this. Uh, Our little girl, Davy. Um, we live on a pretty busy, it's not a busy road, but people drive like 95 miles an hour down it. And uh, uh, so it's a country road that people fly down. And it's a good way, it's, you know, 400 feet from the house. We're, we're set back off the road. We've got a long driveway and the kids ride their bikes up and down the driveway and they play and do all that. But since our kids were old enough to walk, especially with Davy, we've leaned in super, we leaned in with all of them, but the old, other two just don't listen. But Davy does listen. <laughs> and so we've told them that uh, we don't want uh, you know, just stay out of the road, stay out of the road because you get hit by a car, you get hit by a car, be safe, you know, stay out of the road. Every time we get out of the car, even now in a parking lot, when we get out of the car, um, I, I can be walking into Walmart and not even paying attention to what I'm doing and I reach back and there's a little hand that grabs my hand, right? She always holds our hands in the parking lot. It's ingrained into her mind. We, um, and when we go bike riding, sometimes we go bike riding down this road. And uh, so we'll be on the safe side of the road and I'm, I'm keeping my eyes open, looking for cars and everything. And Davey will go, dad, 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 there's a car. There's a car, dad, 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 there's a car. And I look up and I say, I, sweetie, I see it. It's 1500 yards away. It's okay. But she sees it and it scares her. She's afraid of it because she doesn't want to get hit. Okay? She'll pull off to the side of the road down in the ditch. And I'm like, sweetie, they're still at the stop sign. And it's a half mile down the road. What are you doing? I don't want to get run over. There's a fear there, okay? It's a good fear. Don't want to get hit by a car. Hold mommy and daddy's hand in the parking lot so I don't get flattened. That's a good thing. But here's the thing. She doesn't lay in bed at night and think, the road's out there. They might come get me. The road's out there. The cars might come get me. That's what we talk about when we talk about good fear. It's not, am I going to lose my salvation? It's not, that's not, that's not the call. The idea here, the author is like, listen, I'm laying this before you just as a warning. Be careful. Just don't go in the road. That's the call. That keeps her safe. That's what keeps us safe. So what do we do with it? What do we do with this warning? Look at verse 7. He says, for the ground that drinks the rain that often falls on it and that produces vegetation useful for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. But if it produces thorns and thistles, it's worthless and about to be cursed and at the end will be burned. So what do we do with it? How do we respond? What's what's the call? I think it's that we pursue growth. I think that's the idea. Pursue growth. Go after it. And trust God to provide the growth as we pursue it. That's why in Hebrews, uh, when we just read in verse 3, Uh, where he says, and we will do this if God permits, right? It's the same idea. We're just gonna pursue it. We're gonna pursue growth. And if God allows it, we're gonna grow. And that's the way that it's gonna respond. And he says in this passage, useful to those for whom it is cultivated receives a blessing from God. If we pursue, God will bless. And it's not, I'm doing this so God will love me. It's not, I'm gonna pursue growth so that God will look down and go and smile. No, it's God loves me. I've received this grace. I wanna know him better. So I'm gonna pursue that growth. That's the idea. We don't pursue it to be saved. We don't pursue it to find salvation. We have salvation. We've been forgiven. We are children of God. And because of that, we pursue these things. I mean, the mark of a believer is the fruit that's produced in their life. We produce fruit, according to this passage, that's useful to the kingdom of God. We bless the body of Christ. We're useful. 
And the fruit marks the person. I mean, he talks about here, he's talking about, two, he's talking about ground here. And he says, so the good ground, it produces good fruit, fruit that endures. And this specific thing he's talking about, these, these Christians were under persecution. And he's like, listen, you're going to hang in there. You're going to produce this fruit, and it's going to be fruit that, that, is, that is going to mature, to, to endure. And they grow to maturity in the faith and the things of God. That's the idea. It says the other patch of ground produces fruit that won't endure. Ultimately, what they're producing won't last. And we won't know that till eternity, right? We, we, we won't know that. But it, it may look good for a while, but, but it won't endure. When a field is first planted, I don't know if we have any farmer folk in here, but when, when, when a field is first planted and those shoots begin to break the surface, you can't tell what the good fruit is from the bad at the beginning. It takes a minute, right? Stuff's got to grow up before we can see what it is. But over time, the nature of that plant becomes clear. And he goes on in 9 through 11, and he's encouraging them, right? He says, even though we're speaking this way, dearly loved ones, in your case, we're confident that things are better, and are, we're confident that things are better and that pertain to salvation. For God is not unjust. He will not forget your work and the love you demonstrated for his name by serving the saints and by continuing to serve them. Now we, now we desire each of you to demonstrate the same diligence. That's that practicing idea, right? The same diligence for the full assurance of your hope until the end so that you won't become lazy but will be imitators of those who inherit the promises through faith and perseverance. He says, listen, guys, I'm laying this warning before you, but I need you to see we're confident of better things for you. We see better things happening. But we, I need to lay this warning before you because becoming lazy leads to problems. You need to fix it. We need to make sure that doesn't happen. The, waiting for, the warning for them isn't to make sure that they're believers. That, that, that's the, the warning for them is but rather to communicate to them as believers the dangers of choosing to remain in a perpetual state of immaturity. I'm, I'm, I'm a believer. I am good to go. I, when I, I came to faith in Christ, I'm standing at the starting line because Scripture talks about our faith being a race, right? I run the race that's set before me. It's, the idea is that they, uh, he's warning them, listen, when you come to that starting line, when that gun goes off, don't just stand there. That's the call. He's like, I know you guys are going to run this thing, but you got to get going. You got to move. You got to start taking those steps forward. There's a good fear for the Christian. There's a call to, 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 to evaluate ourselves and, and, and our commitment to following Christ. Just, just like Davy in the road, like there's a, there's, a, there, there, there's a call to recognize the danger of what happens if we choose to become lazy in our faith. And the antidote to that is just to pursue growth, to go after those things, to spend time in prayer, to spend time in the word, to spend time engaging with one another, to lean in, to do more than just show up on Sunday morning. Super glad you're here. But you know what I'm saying? To do more, like to lean into our faith. So as I close this morning, if you call Christ the Lord of your life, are you pursuing him? Are you going after him? Are you seeking to grow in your faith? Are you seeking not, not to become a theologian, none of that sort of stuff, but are, are you seeking to just know him more, to know him better, to peel back some of those layers, as it were? Or have you gotten sidetracked? Have you gotten distracted? Were you running the race and at some point you just kind of stopped and started looking around and watched everybody else run by Have you come somehow come to a place maybe where you've just sat down? Have you become lazy about your faith? I don't need to, I don't need to come to church this week. I'm just gonna, I'm gonna rest at home or I'm, I'm, I'm not, I'm, I, don't, I don't need to open God's word. I mean, I'm fine. I read last week. I'm good. Like, or I'm not gonna spend any time in prayer. Like, are we doing, or like, is, have we just become lazy? I'm just going to wait for Jay to tell me some stuff on Sunday morning. It'll be great. Instead of diving in yourself. One of the things that we push in our Bible studies so often is that you can study God's word on your own. You can dive in. You can learn. You can grow. And when you come to those questions, we're here to help answer them. Or to look at you and say, I don't know, but I'll find out. 
If you claim Christ as your Lord, the call for you is to lean in and to work out your salvation with fear and trembling and to not do it, to not do that. is to be spiritually lazy. Maybe you're here and you've been in church your entire life. And as I was reading through some of that, you realize that despite your head knowledge, despite the way, the fact that you love music, the, the, our worship, despite the, all the things, coming to Bible studies or whatever they be, maybe you realize today that you've not given him your heart. You know all about him. You've tasted You've seen, you've been a part of what happens in this space, but he's not your Lord. Today's the day to change that. We'd love to talk with you about what it looks like to give your life to Christ. I beg you, don't put it off. Don't say, I'll deal with it next week. I'll deal with it later. Let me think about it. Respond this morning. Give your life to Christ. And if you're here, Christian, and you're lazy, can I encourage you as your pastor to get up and get moving? God's got a mission for us. He's got stuff that he wants to do in our community. He wants got stuff that he wants to do in the lives of the people that are around you, and he wants to use you to do it. But if you're just sitting there on the track, you're not running, you're not producing useful fruit, for the kingdom. Please repent of that this morning. Ask God to forgive you and then say, God, you know what? If you permit, I want to grow. I want to pursue these things. I want to get to know you more. I want to see you work in my life. I want to do those things. We're going to close with communion. If you guys want to grab those cups out that you received. We do an open communion here at the crossing. And what I mean by that is uh, it doesn't matter your faith background. If you profess Christ as your Lord and Savior, we welcome you to receive communion with us. And as you, as you, uh, Eat the wafer that represents the body of Christ that was broken for you as you peel back that that top layer and, and you drink the juice that represents the blood that Christ shed for your sins. I encourage you this morning uh, to lean into God's grace. Dietrich Bonhoeffer talks about the notion of cheap grace, and it's this idea that, that we, 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 we just assume that since the price has been paid, then the, the call in our lives to live holiness, to, to live a holy life, to step out in faith, to, to, to proceed, to pursue him, to pursue Christ in our relationship isn't necessary because Christ has already died. He's paid the price for our sin. The grace is poured out on our lives. He calls that cheap grace. But the reality is that the grace that God pours out should move us to pursue holiness, should move us to grow because we know what it costs him to pour it out on us. And our response is to to pursue. So I'm gonna pray and we'll give you a few minutes to receive communion. And then as we sing, uh, here and, and as we close, we'll have people at the crosses. Um, if you'd like, if you haven't, if you would say, Jay, I don't know if I'm a believer. I'm not sure. I, I prayed a prayer when I was a kid, and, and, but I'm not 100% sure. If you would like to know what it means, if you'd like to nail that down today, we can nail it down. If you want to give your life to Christ, we can do that. Christian, if you're here and you're like, I've been lazy, I encourage you to come down here and spend some time before God. Confess that. And make the choice to, to begin to pursue the things of God. Would y'all pray with me? Father God, thank you for this day. Thank you, Lord, for the grace that you pour out on us over and over and over again. Lord, we recognize that it costs you your son. As we receive communion this morning, we give you honor and we give you praise. Jesus, we lift you high. We ask you if you would move in this space, would you speak to our hearts? Would you bring conviction where conviction is warranted? Would you bring peace for those of us that are in, in, a, in a place where we say we are pursuing, we are going after. 
God, you are answering, you are moving. Would you give us peace? Would you give us calm? Would you move us to worship you because of what you're doing in our lives? Lord, for those of us that have gotten tired, maybe we've just, for honest, we've just been lazy spiritually. Again, would you move us to respond to your spirit? That we would stand up and start running that race again. Father, we love you. We praise you and we thank you for this day. And it's in your son's name we pray. Amen. You guys receive communion as you're ready.